very happy to be here, Mark. Um, well, I'm Craig Shesky, CFO of The Metals Company. Um, we are developing what we view as a nickel project, but it's a different kind of nickel project. It's 1.6 billion tons of polymetallic nodules, and I have a little show and tell here. Uh, this is roughly a potato-sized rock, of which uh, this comprises that 1.6 billion tons of our uh, total estimated resource. The difference is, is that it lays unattached on the seafloor of the Clarion Clipperton zone of the Pacific Ocean. So usually right there, we're talking to certain investors who might just uh, shut off their ears and say, okay, that sounds crazy. Um, but it's actually a very unique resource in that it's very high grades of a lot of the battery metals that we're talking about. So it's 3.2% nickel equivalent. Um, if you break that down into the four constituent metals, it's 1.3% nickel, 1.1% copper, uh, call it 0.2% cobalt, and nearly 30% manganese. So mining.com recently ranked us the number one and number two largest nickel projects on the planet. And, and just to add on that, too, I mean, you have the carbon intensity when it comes to the actual mining process. And another element that a lot of people uh, don't think as much about, and I think it's particularly relevant for Indonesia, is what are the carbon sinks that are at risk due to the fact that, you know, to get this lower grade laterite, mm -hmm. um, you are, you know, clear cutting quite a bit of forest to do so and releasing all of that carbon into the atmosphere. So are consumers going to want to see that carbon impact in addition to the very high 60 kilograms uh, for every one kilogram of nickel for some of the worst nickel laterites in Indonesia. On top of that, you have the carbon sinks at risk too. Um, so it's a tough thing to get around. And uh, on the ESG, we talk a lot about carbon, carbon, but it's also waste and it's also tailings. And it's another difficulty with Indonesian nickel, which by the way is where pretty much all of the net supply growth is supposed to come from, most of which is already guaranteed to China via existing offtake. But you're talking about the waste and tailings, which even if it's no longer disposed into the ocean or rivers, well, it's a seismic area. So you have to find a place to put those tailings. And dry stack tailings requires additional cutting of forest. So it's a reckoning that I think a lot of consumers and automakers and other brands are going to have to really think through. Yeah. And obviously, with respect to your company, there is a specific ESG challenge. Sure. Um, you know, deep sea mining is something that ostensibly a lot of companies would probably feel slightly opposed to. Um, so how are you trying to manage that? Well, letting the science do the talking is really the, the best way to do that. Um, when we hear deep sea mining, you know, nothing could be easier to support than protect the oceans, right? You know, we've screwed up land. Why should we open up the oceans as a new frontier? And a lot of people don't think much further than that. But just like on land, there are some projects that are responsible and palatable, many of which are put forward by a lot of the people in this room. And there are others that are, you know, less socially and environmentally conscious. And it's the same thing when it comes to ocean minerals. So what we are focusing on is collection of polymetallic nodules that sit unattached on top of the seafloor in an abyssal desert where there's very, very little life per square meter. And in fact, it's a 1,500 times less life per square meter than what you would find in Indonesia, for example, uh, underneath uh, some of those rainforests, 300 times less life than the land-based average. So we've been investing a lot in our environmental and social impact assessment, uh, roughly $75 million, been 170 days at sea last year um, to continue this research. And we think, you know, while there is no perfect solution, this is a solution that is of such a large scale and such potential importance for the U.S. and other jurisdictions that we should have a fair shake. And importantly, too, we're going to be out there operating with the digital twin, um, a cloud-based AI system that will actually be beaming information on our operations to the regulator and stakeholders in real time. And we're starting with one ship. So I think what we would tell people is, look, the necessity of these metals for the clean transition is so important. And this area alone has 3.4 times more cobalt, uh, 1.8 times more nickel, 1.2 times more manganese than all known land-based reserves combined. Are we just going to shut our brains off and say, no, that sounds bad, let's not do it? Or should we let the science do the talking? And with our first system, you'll actually be able to see us in operations. If things change, we can change course with it. So why not at least start small and show the world that this can be done right?